You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. All right, in the last session you talked about, uh, this, this session, by the way, is, uh, this Q&A is intended to kind of get to know him. Somebody asking in a conversational way some questions about Don and his background, his wife, his kids, etc. Before we do that, I want to tell a little story. Um, you mentioned holding in your hand the manuscript that Jonathan Edwards preached, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Offered. Trying to hold it. Trying to hold it. Um, so I, I, I understand that sentiment. And I want to tell a little story connected to this before we get into this. Um, this last year in March, when I was at Shepherd's Conference, they had back in the Shepherd's Shop, there's an organization that curates a lot of Spurgeon's uh, documents and artifacts. And they had three of these pages of manuscripts that Spurgeon had. When Spurgeon would preach, he would have basically people in the front row writing out his, his sermons, because his sermons were just on like a three-by-five index card, but little pieces of paper. He would just write out a couple of words for an outline, then he would mostly preach that extemporaneously, and then somebody would write that down and transcript it, and then they would give that transcript to Spurgeon. He would edit those and give them back, and then they would be published and printed and sent overseas and, and wired to America, etc. So they had three of these pieces of paper, which were the manuscripts that Spurgeon himself had edited. So his handwriting is on there, crossing out lines, making little changes to it. And they said, these are the last three that we have left, and they were $200 a piece. And they come with the certification that this is actually his manuscript, and this is a foundation that runs all of this. And, and I, so I texted a picture of that to my wife, and I said, you're going to believe this. This is the, the page that Spurgeon himself edited. So this is just incredible. You can pick these things up and look at it. Spurgeon held this and Spurgeon wrote on this. And of course, my heart was just warmed by that. And uh, so Deidre emailed me, or sorry, uh, my wife called me and she said, you've got to buy one of those. Like 200 bucks. And she said, consider it your Christmas gift, your birthday present, your (laughs) anniversary present for like the next three years, however long. So just, just, you need to have one of those for yourself. So I went ahead and bought one and uh, took it to the truck and I was excited about it all day long. So later that afternoon, I saw Phil Johnson out in the courtyard. Of course, Phil, we had here as a Spurgeon expert. And I said, oh, Phil, you're, not, you're never going to believe this. I said, over in the shepherd shop today, they had these three uh, handwritten manuscripts that Spurgeon himself edited of one of his sermons. And uh, I said, they had three of them on display there, and they were selling them. And, and Phil said, oh, yeah, those are great, aren't they? I have a whole stack of them. I'll give you one. <laughs> 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 so well, thanks, Phil. You're just a couple Spurgeon, hours late. Tell a little Spurgeon story myself. I used to go to England a lot, and I went to Spurgeon's church, the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Dr. Peter Masters is the pastor there now, been for 30 years. Took me to his office, and we chatted, and uh, he said, well, you might be interested in a couple things. So we went up into the rafters, and he showed me the original trowel that was used to put the mortar on the bricks at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, from which the sword and trowel was taken. Mm -hmm. And then he said, do you see that couch over there? I said, yes. He said, that's a settee. Okay. He said, that was Spurgeon's. He said he used to sit in his office. His wife, Susanna, would come down. They'd sit on that and have lunch, and they'd smooch a little bit. He said, we have no use for it. Do you want it? Do Do I what? Do you want it? I'll give it to you. Uh, yeah. Let me uh, check on what it would cost to ship it back to the United States. I don't know what I'd do with it, uh, other than to just say, guess what this is? And everybody would say, nah, couldn't be. So I contacted a freight company. It would have cost me about five grand for them to build a crate and then to put it on a boat and ship it all the way to the United States. I just couldn't justify that kind of expenditure for something that had no ministry use, but it, eh, it would have been nice. But nobody came up and offered you a free couch that Spurgeon <laughs> sat on. All right. Somebody offered me a free couch that Hobo Bill and his wife sat on. But... <laughs> All right, uh, Don, tell us how you met your wife. Who is your wife? This is Beverly. 
This is a very spiritual story. We met on the internet. <laughs> on something called Match.com. And uh, <clears throat> we finally had a date at an Outback Steakhouse, which she was late for. She was also late for our wedding. <laughs> and uh, my first question to her was, how often do you go to church? My second question is, where do you go to church? And her first question to me was, who do you listen to? And I said, MacArthur and Sproul. And she goes, oh, finally a real Christian. <laughs> As if that was what saved you. <laughs> if I had said Uncle Jim, what would she have said? Yeah. But that's how we met. Uh, Same thing everybody says. <laughs> that's how we met. And uh, we got married in 19... 2005. And uh, that's how we met. Uh, she's younger than I am, but then so is most of the civilized world. So. <laughs> how many kids do you have, grandkids? Two daughters. Uh, Ashley just got... Well, she's had three sons... And they live six miles away, so we're over there a lot. And then my daughter, Michelle, lives in Denver, and she's getting married in Cancun two weeks from now. And she said, Dad, the average wedding in Denver costs $30,000. So don't get married in Denver. <laughs> she says, well, we want to get married in Cancun. Now, I've been saving up for this for years. I said, all right, Shell, I'm sending you a check for $10,000. That's all you get. Make it go as far as you can. Good luck, dear. Are you going to Cancun? Yeah. <laughs> but she said, I only spent 7000 so you can have 3000 back. I thought, that's what we're going to Cancun on. Oh. <laughs> My money. <laughs> How did the Lord save you? Uh, I grew up in an Armenian, antinomian, Southern Baptist church. That may be redundant, but... It was a church, we, I grew up in a small town in central California in the agricultural area. And this was the only church that was a non-baptismal regeneration church. So we went there and it was a typical Southern Baptist church. Every quarter they had the traveling evangelist come in and do a revival. And then he brought with him a gospel quartet that would sing. And uh, I was five at the time. And he gave an invitation. But before the invitation, the pastor of the church said, at the conclusion of the service, we're going to have punch and cookies in the back, so come on down. For... So when the preacher gave the invitation, I went forward for punch and cookies. <laughs> I, you can see what a problem this has been my whole life. <laughs> and they took me in the back and they had me pray the sinner's prayer. And they said, don't ever let anybody make you doubt your salvation. Well, God made me doubt my salvation. Because I was about 30. At the time, I was a college football coach in Missouri. For my vacation, I flew back to L.A. and lived with my brother Dan for a month. And I went to Grace Community Church every time they opened the doors. I listened to both Sunday morning services and the Sunday night service. I'd go to the uh, college and career group. Just anything I could do. I listened to a MacArthur tape in my van on the way in and back. John was in Matthew 7. And he preached two sermons, empty words and empty hearts. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that's the empty words. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's, if you don't do that, you have an empty heart. I realized I'm not saved. No, no, this I'm I had no victory over sin. I had no desire for fellowship. I had no desire for the Bible. Uh, all I wanted to do was be an NFL coach someday. And whatever it took to get there, okay. So on the way home, driving home, I gave my heart to Christ for real. And uh, I wrote a song that night called uh, All That Matters Is Him. I used to sing it at Grace. Mm. And... Uh, I gave that to them as a gift. Uh, no royalties, just take it and use it. And then all of a sudden I developed an appetite. And uh, I couldn't get enough. 
And there was a man named John Stone, who's the librarian at Masters University and Seminary Libraries. He had quite a collection of the Puritans. <clears throat> and I was over at his house once, and I said, could I borrow one of these? He goes, you can, nobody else can. So I took it home and read one book, and I was hooked. Because this wasn't a modern-day, it's-all-about-me book. In fact, years ago, a newspaper reporter from the uh, Portland whatever the Portland newspaper is, called me. She had seen a copy of one of my books at Powell's Used Bookstore in Portland, which is a huge used bookstore. I have a big religion section. And she saw one of my books there, and so she called me and said, why do you publish these? And I says, because this was when Christianity was about Christ, not about what you can get out of him. She goes, my goodness, that is different. A secular newspaper reporter realized that. Jonathan Edwards once said, if you only love Christ for what you can get out of him, you don't love Christ, you love yourself. And that's what I love about these books. They're all about Christ. Um, in fact, when I first started editing, I was doing this as my devotional. I was a college football coach, but I get up at six and type a Puritan book just for my own devotions. And I finished one, <clears throat> And I sent a sample chapter to Zondervan to see if they were interested in publishing it. And they sent me back a rejection letter that said, your books are too God-centered. What year was that? Oh, it would have been uh, mid-80s. Zondervan has improved since then, haven't they? I have no idea. No, they haven't. The answer that's when no, they, they said haven't. no to me, that, that's to you no. guys. <laughs> wow. But that's how I got started. And... Uh, the reason I started publishing was I offered this manuscript to three different publishers and they all turned me down. I said, nuts to them, I'll do it myself. My best friend at the time was a banker with PNC Bank in Pittsburgh, where I was living at the time. <clears throat> and his job was to give money away. <laughs> Gee, what a coincidence, huh? And... Uh, he gave me a grant of $5,000 to publish a book of historical value. I could care less about the religious part. And so I, I published this book, which is Jeremiah Burroughs on the Beatitudes. I had asked three men for their opinion, MacArthur, John Gerstner, and Al Martin, a Reformed Baptist guy from New Jersey. And I got three different answers. MacArthur, I said, John, should I leave the pastoral ministry to publish books? He goes, no. You shouldn't. We don't have enough good pulpiteers as it is. And we don't need to lose another one just to publish books. Okay. Dr. Gerstner, should I leave the preaching ministry to publish the Puritans? Don Kistler, how many people do you preach to on a given Sunday? 40 to 50? And if people read the Puritans, how many of them buy your books? Is it about 1,000? It would be an absolute sin for you to remain in the pulpit ministry says, these are far better sermons than anything you'll ever do. <laughs> okay. And I asked Al Martin, and he says, well, try it. If it doesn't work, you can always go back. So I published one book. They were all sold three weeks before they were due to be in my possession. Maybe we got something here. And people wanted more and more and more. And so after four years in the pulpit ministry... I quit before I did any real damage to any of the people in the congregation and uh, started publishing, and it took off. So, so I've been doing this uh, for almost 35 years. So after you got saved, did you go back to coaching football? Uh, yes. For how long? Uh, well, I coached for 22 years, so that would have been until about 84. And, and then, uh, then we moved to Pennsylvania, where I was coaching and I was getting into my late 40s, and I was going around the country saving other guys' jobs. Uh, Wheaton College was the worst football program I'd ever seen. Uh, th their motto was, let's lose for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, I got an idea. Why don't we win for Jesus? We had a quarterback in a scrimmage who was running into the end zone. He dropped the football. The head coach said, why in the world would you do that? And he said, I don't know. It must have been God's will. Whoa, this is hyper-Calvinism. Yeah, right that's right. 
So uh, I wanted to be a head coach, but I was never going to get the opportunity. I'd saved three guys' jobs, but it never translated into a head job for me. So I was doing this pulpit supply around western Pennsylvania, and the churches would often say to me, we're without a pastor, would you be interested in candidating? I always had the same answer. I'd be most happy to talk to you. Here's my phone number. Give me a call. Put it back on them. They never did. <clears throat> well, this one church in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, which, yes, which is where Ligonier Ministries came from. I preached out there, and the uh, elder said to me, we're looking for a pastor. Would you be interested? And I said, I'd be interested in talking to you. And he called. So I went out there and candidated, and they called me. And they said, what do you need as a salary? And I said, what are you offering? And they said, 12000 for the year? A whole thousand a month? Yes. I said, I'm going to have to say no. Because the Bible says a man that doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. I'd be an unbeliever if I accepted that offer because I couldn't provide for my family. But I have to tell you a couple anecdotes of pulpit supply around western Pennsylvania. There was a congregational church downtown Beaver Falls. This is Joe Namath's hometown. Joe Namath was a football player. <laughs> so some of us know oh. that. And uh, so I was sent down there to uh, Pulpit Supply, and they were without a pastor. <clears throat> and I said, what happened to your pastor? And they said, well, his way of doing things was after he preached, he went up, sat down in the chair, bowed his head, and prayed. And he wanted us to meditate for five minutes. And about a month ago, he finished preaching, went up and sat down in his chair, bowed his head, and died. I, what a way to go for a pastor. Yeah. You preach, and the next thing, there's Jesus. whoop de doo And I, I said, well, how did you know he was dead? Well, the five minutes went by, and he didn't move, and eight to ten minutes went by. One of the deacons said, we better go check on him. He went and poked him. He fell over. So anyway, I thought I'd break the ice. And I said, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here in a congregational church. Some of my best friends were congregational preachers. Jonathan Edwards, Solomon Stoddard, Jeremiah Burroughs, Thomas Goodwin, and I named three or four. And after the service, the uh, deacon came up to me and said, you know, we're looking for a pastor. Do you think any of those men would be interested? <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up better than it is. One day I got a call at the office, and uh, it was a lady with a strong Texas accent. I'll just say her name was Wanda, I don't know, don't remember her name. Hello, uh, this is Wanda calling from Pastor Billy Bob in Sweetwater, Texas. Yes, he just read a book of yours called Thoughts on Family Worship. Yes, that's one of our books, written by James W. Alexander. Well, he liked it so much, we'd like to schedule Reverend Alexander for our family conference this year. <laughs> now, on the back of the book, there's an engraving of him with the years 1798 to 1846. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm pretty used to guys trying to punk me. I mean, I'm as much of a smart aleck as anybody. But nothing came. <laughs> so I said, well, Wanda... James Alexander's been dead for 150 years. You ready? So shall I tell the pastor he will not be available? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell him that. <laughs> that was a long answer to a short question. Yeah, it was. Well, actually, I answered about five questions in there. So after, uh, after college, or after coaching college ball, you went into pastoral ministry. Was there a time that you attended Grace Community Church? Yes, for about five years. And uh, when was I had that? actually known John. I met him when I was in college, and he was doing a lot of speaking for Talbot Seminary, <clears throat> kind of an itinerant preacher. Well, at the time, I was a member of a bluegrass band in college. I played the five-string banjo, and we did a lot of stuff for Youth for Christ. Now it's called Campus Life, I think. And they had an outreach thing they called the Burger Bash, which somebody in the Campus Life Club would host 
an outdoor barbecue and swimming in the pool, and then they'd have a speaker, and he'd get up and preach and give an invitation. Well, the guy would often have us come sing four bluegrass songs, and then John would preach. But back then, he was more of a youth speaker comedian. Um, he modeled himself after a man from Hume Lake named Ken Poor. Um, and now John is so sober-minded and serious and grave. But that's how we met. So we've been friends for 53 years now. And uh, that means a lot to me. I don't think it means anything to John, but <laughs> I'm proud of that. So what years do you attend, Grace? Uh, it would have been in the early 80s. Um, well, for several years in the 70s, and then I took a coaching job in Missouri. And uh, this was a United Methodist College, which was loosely affiliated with the United Methodist Church. And I got my first personal taste of liberalism. First Sunday, they had a campus church. So I decided I'm going to start there, and if it's no good, I'll go this way, and I'll broaden out till I find something. And I walked in with a suit and a tie on, carrying my new American Standard Bible. And I noticed that I was the only one who had a Bible. That included the minister. The scripture reading that day was from the old novel Zorba the Greek. And of course, he couldn't have anybody turn to page 14 and read along with me. The sermon that day was how the Christian life was like an episode of the old black and white western wagon train. God is the wagon master. Jesus is the scout who goes before us and comes back and tells us what's out there. And the Holy Spirit is the saloon girl. The, the saloon girl was a bra, was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. This isn't going to work. So the next week I went to the local Baptist church. And they did two things I really don't like. They said, reach in front of you and give the person in the pew in front of you a neck rub. Oh. <laughs> Don't touch me. <laughs> and then it was a small congregation, and then the minister said, uh, Mr. Kister, would you come back to the back and let the people greet you? Oh, okay. There's only about 30 people there. And an old lady on a walker comes up, no teeth, she says, are you a Baptist? <laughs> and at that time in my life, I had had it with denominations, all that stuff. And I just says, you know, ma'am, I'm just a Christian. Well, that's good too. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't be a Baptist, the next best thing is <laughs> to be a Christian. <laughs> so where were you baptized? At Grace Community Church. Um, my wife and I, I realized I had been baptized young, but I wasn't saved. And so I think I, I need to be baptized as an actual Christian. Well, they have a baptismal tank, probably like yours here, where you go down into the water. <clears throat> and John's wearing wading boots and a frock. And people would walk down and he'd take them. Should I tell the story about the paral paralysis? Yeah, do. Yeah. It wasn't this night, but it was another night. They brought in a man who was a quadriplegic. He couldn't walk, so they carried him and handed him to John. <clears throat> and the man paralyzed from the chin down, but he had a stylus in his mouth, like Johnny Erickson paints. And he had a machine that could make words. And so John insists, I don't care if you're paralyzed or not, you're going to give your testimony before I baptize you. So he says, what's your name? My name is Bob. Well, Bob, I'm glad you're here. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am, John. And Bob, how does a person become a Christian? I thought you already knew that, John. <laughs> John almost dropped him. He was laughing. At him. And you can imagine what... 4,000 people did out there. I mean, it was a while before John recovered. And uh, the night I was baptized, I went down 
you're barefoot, and they have a wooden grate on the floor because the, I don't know what, what that stuff is, very smooth when it's wet, plaster or something like that. If you didn't stand on something solid, you'd slip and fall. That never looks good at a baptism. No. <laughs> so I went to the front wall, and there's a microphone there, and I started to give my uh, testimony. There's four or 5,000 people out there. Getting a little nervous. I start fidgeting with my foot. I got my foot stuck between two of the boards in the front, and I couldn't pry it loose. So I just kept talking and talking. I must have given a 10-minute testimony. Finally, I got my foot free, and I said, well, that's it, and I got it left. I had people come after me, up to me afterwards, that's the best baptismal testimony I've ever heard. How did you do all that off the top of your head? Well, I can't tell them I had to. My foot was stuck. So I just had a lot to say. Anyway, that's where I was baptized. Gotcha. And now you, then you moved to Pennsylvania, you took a pastorate there. I moved to Pennsylvania to work at Geneva College as a football coach, and from there I became a pastor after four years. How many churches have you pastored? Just one. Uh, I got out before I needed any real damage. Uh, how, how, many, how long? Four years. And then I went to do the publishing full-time. It had to be one or the other. But the church had doubled in size, and the publishing was going great. And uh, Is the church still uh, Yeah, they're still today? going. Uh, they have about 100 now in attendance. And uh, there was a lady that came, and I always noticed the visitors because they sat in the wrong row. The rows were named by the people who'd been sitting there 100 years. <clears throat> the second row was Mr. and Mrs. Fisher. They were in their 90s. And everybody knew that's the Fisher row. Well, one day, some visitors came in who didn't know that was the Fisher row. They sat there, and the Fishers always came late because they were very, I don't want to say disabled, but slow. They got down to their row and saw people, and Mr. Fisher raised his cane, and he was about to hit the guy. <laughs> and the, one of the elders said, no, no, it's okay. Can you sit somewhere else for one day? Yeah. What year did you get into publishing? Uh, 1988 was the first year. And how many titles do you have in print right now? Well, with the first publisher, I did over 400, Solidale Warrior. And then I started over as the Northampton Press in 2017, and I've done 35 titles with them. So almost 500 titles altogether. So you started Northampton Press. Did you yes. start Solidale Gloria? Yes. So why two different companies? Well, uh, in 2004, uh, we joined forces with Ligonier Ministries and moved the whole thing to Florida. And they had a lot of money, and we didn't. And then a year and a half later, they fired me and kept it all. And that was my life's work, and it was gone. And so I spent a year and a half depressed, and then I just said, I'm starting over. So I started a new one. The Northampton Press is named for the town in Massachusetts where Jonathan Edwards pastored, Northampton, Massachusetts. And on the spine of our books is our logo, which is an artist's rendering of the church where he pastored and what it would have looked like. So uh, that's how. So the currently with Northampton Press, you run the entire thing. You do the editing. I do the editing. Setting. I used to do the typing, but then the arthritis would set in. I can do the editing, but I have two volunteer typists. One's a school teacher in Singapore. I just emailed her the PDF files, and she can read the old English, and she types them, sends them back to me as Microsoft Word files, and then I make them into book format. And I do all the editing, so it always looks equally good or bad, but then you can tell it was the same guy. And then I have proofreaders who go through and find mistakes and everything, and uh, then our publisher is up in Michigan, and I've been using them for 34 years. I did a local publisher the first time, and they couldn't, they couldn't get the stuff out in a timely fashion. So there was a man in Virginia named Lloyd Sprinkle, who was a Reformed Baptist pastor, which is an interesting last name, Sprinkle, for a Baptist yeah. pastor. And he'd been doing these kind of books 
for years, sprinkled publications, but most of the ones he did were Christians in the Civil War. And uh, I said, who do you use? And he told me the name of the publisher. I've been using them ever since. They have outbid even publishers in China, print shops. They can beat the prices, but it's four to six months on a freighter to get to me. Hmm. And I can get them in a week from Michigan. So, uh, like I said, they print them on acid-free paper. They sew them together instead of glue them together. I have a professional artist do the covers. And uh, they're all limited quantities. Uh, It's a niche market, obviously. How long did you work for Ligonier before they fired you? About a year and a half. Oh, that was fast. Yeah. And what year was that? They fired me in 2006. So with titles that are already out of print, Puritan titles, is, can, can you take the 400 that you did before and republish them? They don't belong them? to me anymore. They, they belong to Joel Beakey at Reformation Heritage up in Grand Rapids. Uh, he has the publishing rights and all the copyrights. Mm. So uh, he gave me back my own book and the uh, titles by Christopher Love, who's my favorite English Puritan, Edwards is obviously my favorite American Puritan. And, uh, but basically everything after that, we're doing. So do you have to get permission to print these titles that are about No, the, there wasn't any such thing as a copyright till 1901. So anything before that is public domain. But a copyright's only good for 50 years. So we're well past that stage for anything from 1900 to 1950. But the old English books, there's no copyright on them. It's public domain. There's an uh, organization called Early English Books Online, EBO. They set about in the 1950s to Xerox on microfilm every book published in English before 1900. And then they got bought out by Xerox, and then they got bought out by... Uh, I'm not sure who has it now, but it's early English books online. Uh, Dan's oldest son was a librarian for a while at a university. Was it Utah State or Utah? Utah And uh, he called me. You have to have a subscription to Ebo. He called me one day and says, here, I'll give you my username and password. Go in and get whatever you want. So I spent six months nonstop downloading over 4,000 Puritan books onto my web, on my computer in PDF files. And then I can just email that attachment to one of my typists who are very conversant with the Old English. And what I do editing-wise is I break a 26-page paragraph down into smaller chunks. I don't <laughs> take anything out. I just make them... And my motto is I'm going to give you a reason to read, not a reason not to. And then if it's King James English in the regular text, I update it. If it's King James English in the scripture, I leave it alone. I have people who won't buy the book if it's not King James English in the scripture text. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, book seller up here in Montana, Choteau, Montana. And he bought some books from me. And a week later, sent them all back and said, this isn't the King James English, and I won't use it. And I said, well, here's the problem. The sermon you're referring to was preached 19 years before there was a King James Bible. (laughs) He couldn't have used the King James Version. He said, it doesn't matter. I said, are you saying there was no Bible until 1611? That's what I'm saying. I have no toleration for that kind of idiocy. I just don't. In fact, I used to get mail from England that would have little stickers on it. Read the Bible God reads, the King James Version. (laughs) I'm pretty sure God reads the Hebrew (laughs) and the Greek. Or he could say, like, when I was in Wheaton, Illinois one time, I was talking to a guy, and he said, uh, talking about a book, I said, have you read this book? He says, I wrote that book. Oh, God could say the same thing. Have you read the King James Bible? No, I read the original, thank you. <laughs> you start off in a church that was Arminian, Baptist, and antinomian. Those are the words you yes. used to describe that. How did you, that was before you were saved, 
how did you come to Reformed convictions? Getting saved under MacArthur's preaching, did you immediately adopt that, or were you... Well, at the time, John was not a five-pointer. Yeah. Uh, he spoke at a conference I put on in Pittsburgh where he came out. I hate to use that phrase because of what it means today. <laughs> yeah. Where he emerged, <laughs> and he says, if you're saying, are you preaching the limited atonement? I'm saying, yes, I am. And that was a big turning point. But one thing about John is if he's convinced from Scripture, yeah. that's what it means. And uh, I've always sent John a copy of every book I've ever published just because of our friendship. And uh, he reads them. And uh, there's a story about not too far into his ministry where two of his top assistants, who you both know, walked in and put their resignation letters on his desk. So, what's this? John, that sermon you preached yesterday was a Roman Catholic sermon. What? What? You had sanctification before justification. And if that's what you believe, we can't work for you or with you. And they pointed out to John, and he said, you're right, I did. So, I mean, he'll do that if you can show him where he's wrong. He'll, he'll mm -hmm. amend it. So, there isn't often that he is wrong, but if he is wrong, he'll, uh, he'll own up to it. So how did you come to those theological convictions? Well, when I left... Grace Community Church it was in the uh, mid-70s, and I went to central Missouri to work at this Methodist church, and uh, I was in the college and career group at the time, the singles people, 600 single people. Talk about a smorgasbord. <laughs> and uh, they gave me copies of every sermon John had preached for the first 13 years. And I drove a U-Haul truck, and I listened to the most of them on the way to Missouri. And it was just one right after the other. And it was all these entire books, Hebrews, First and Corinthians, John, uh, First John. And uh, John would review the first 15 minutes of what he'd done the week before, and he says, I don't believe they remember anything I've said. <laughs> and uh, also, when I got back there, I subscribed to two, quote, religious publications Christianity Today, and Moody, monthly. And in both those magazines, the first issue I got, there was a half-page ad by a guy named R.C. Sproul. I didn't know it was Sproul. On the holiness of God. Well, I had been reading the sermons of Jonathan Edwards because I did my genealogy, and from my dad's line, I come through Jonathan Edwards, and from my mother's line, I come from Oliver Cromwell. So I tell people, if anyone was ever predestined to love the Puritans, here's your guy. So I was reading Edwards out of ancestral curiosity. And uh, I was about five sermons in, and I came to this conclusion. I've never read this stuff before. But if this is Christianity, I'm not a Christian. And then it was MacArthur's sermons after that. Hmm. But uh, So I started listening to Sproul tapes. And that was my first exposure to the Reformed faith. And I listened to his nine lectures at the time on the holiness of God. And it had the same effect on me it had on Chuck Colson. It just put me on my face. And uh, so I was ripe for when we got out. I got out to California and heard John. I mean, it was just a matter of reeling me in like this. But it, so far, it's proven to be true. Hmm. Have you had any major theological shifts after that coming to that uh, the last thing to fall was the baptism issue. I'd been raised a Baptist, and, uh, and now I'm a pedo-Baptist. Although you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, I was invited to speak at a conference at a Reformed Baptist church camp up in upstate New York, and I decided just to have a little fun. And I said, all right, this weekend conference, my first message is going to be on the scriptural evidence for infant baptism. Remember, this is a Reformed Baptist camp. And one of the guys in the front row said, it'll be a short talk. <laughs> <laughs> I can't appreciate that. What is your favorite Puritan author? English Puritan Christopher Love. And I wrote why? a book about him. Why? He, died, he was beheaded by Cromwell's forces at the age of 33. So your ancestors were responsible for killing a Puritan. Yes. But... It just shows that true Christians can differ politically. 
and still be true Christians. This was a political issue. Christopher Love believed in the Presbyterian teaching at the time, the divine right of kings. So they supported King Charles and King James, who were ultimately beheaded. But uh, Christopher Love had written a letter and sent some cash to help support the king. That was intercepted by Cromwell's forces. He was thrown in jail and ultimately beheaded. But it's no pun intended, it's a great love story. Because uh, he, he wrote to his wife and he says, tomorrow's my execution day. And she wrote back, no, it's not, it's your promotion day. Mm-hmm. And uh, he wrote back to her, evidently they had couriers going back and forth. And he said, tomorrow on the scaffold, I will not mention your name. But it is not because I do not love you. It is because... If I mention your name, I will lose all control of my emotions. He says, but know this, the last word on my lips as my head falls from my body will be to whisper your name. Oh. Now there's romance. You can't find that in a Hallmark movie. <laughs> There's nothing like that on Lifetime. That's romance. And uh, he left his wife with uh, three boys She was pregnant with a fourth who died two weeks later in birth. But uh, they said this was the beginning of the end for Cromwell um, because he was highly regarded, Christopher Love was highly regarded. And uh, I've published uh, probably 10 or 11 of his books and it's just first rate. He died at the age of 33 and left and left for probably 17, 18 books. Mm. I I teasingly only half tongue in cheek say, God's mercy was that he did not allow the personal computer to be invented till after the Puritans were gone. Yeah. Can you imagine how much output there would have been if John Owen had had a laptop? Yeah. <laughs> or if Jonathan Edwards had a secretary who could type? Probably not as much output. They would have got busy chasing cat videos on YouTube or something <laughs> and got distracted. Well, these pastors were so prolific because one... Everybody in their parish church was within a one square block. There were a hundred churches in one square block of Westminster, London in 1666. One square mile. In one square mile. So every block was its own parish. So if you did visitation, you could do it all in one day. Secondly, they didn't have committee meetings. I had one pastor friend who had a sign on his desk that said, For God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. (laughs) So what does your favorite American, your favorite American period says, Edwards? Jonathan Edwards, yeah. And have you been to where he lived? I went to where he lived. They've done everything in Northampton to erase the memory of the man. Uh, the only thing left is a place called the Edwards Church, which is not his church. They tore his house down and built a Catholic church on top of it. There were two tree, elm trees in the yard called the Edwards Elms. The man bought the property just so he could cut down the trees. They took the sign down that says the home of Jonathan Edwards. Now it says the home of Calvin Coolidge, uh, the president from a long time. Some of you guys are old enough to remember. <laughs> and uh, they just everything they can to erase the memory of that man from, from, the, from their memory. But to me, it's still a shrine. The, the church that stands there now is a couple hundred years old. It wasn't there when he was there. It's pastored by a lesbian. And uh, the only thing still remaining, there are three round concrete steps that you can walk up to get in. Those were there at his church. Everything else is new. And uh, it saddens me um, that they, won't, they don't want anything to do with it. Would you say Edwards is the finest theolog- theologian ever produced on American soil? That's what uh, Lloyd-Jones said. Yeah. And I, I can't disagree with it. Um, it is interesting, in 1953, Yale University Press started to reprint Edwards. <clears throat> Their first book was The Freedom of the Will. And they gave themselves 50 years till 2003, which is the 300-year celebration of his birth, to have published everything he ever wrote. <clears throat> well, they lived pretty high on the hog, and they ran out of money. And all the people who were funding them said, now, you've had 50 years, that's it. 
So they're putting it on the internet now, but um, what was his name? Uh, Perry Miller was the first editor. And Dr. Gerstner described him as a hard-drinking, hard-living atheist. And in the introduction to the freedom of the will, Perry Miller says, I'm glad we no longer live in an age where this hateful theology is propagated on the American people. Gerstner tells the story that they were working in the reading room on sermons, and they were discussing sinners in the hands of an angry God. <clears throat> and Perry was saying, you know, from a sheer literary standpoint, this stuff's priceless. Because in there, Edwards talks about how God is an archer with the arrow of his wrath pointed at the sinner's heart. Now, I don't know if you've ever shot a bow and arrow. I don't mean that little Red Rider toy thing, bing, but a full-size one, six feet tall with a strong cord. Pulling that thing back is, oh, your hand's shaking. I said, just think of being the guy at the other end. Think, his hand's shaking. And Edward says, the only thing that keeps God from letting that arrow fly and being made drunk with the sinner's blood is the sheer good pleasure of a God who is infinitely angry at him. And Gerstner said to Perry Miller, he says, Perry, if Edwards is right, that arrow was pointed at your heart. I don't know how you sleep at night. <laughs> and his answer was, sometimes I don't. I just hope to God he's wrong. <laughs> when we lived near Pittsburgh Airport, <clears throat> One night there was a crash, a plane crash. Flight 721 from Chicago, United Airlines flight, was coming into Pittsburgh. <clears throat> At 10,000 feet, the rear steering me mechanism gave out. The plane plunged straight down 10,000 feet and disintegrated. Killed everybody on board. 119 people. Well, a fellow up the street from me was a local sheriff, and he was part of the cleanup crew. And I saw him at the supermarket one day, and I said, what was that like? And he says, I, I'm still shaking. And I said, uh, it must have been terrible. He goes, yeah. He says, everything was body parts. He says, the only intact body was a little six-year-old girl. Everything else, body parts strewn all over the place. I said, that had to be terrible. Oh, that wasn't the worst. What was worse than that? Over by a bush, I found a hand by itself with the fingers crossed. And when you go to meet God, you better have something more than your fingers crossed. <laughs> but, uh, that's what people are saying. I'm not that bad, and God's not that mad. Yes, he is. The only thing the equivalent of God's love is his wrath. And where it says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard the things that God has stored up for those that love him, same is true of his wrath. Mm -hmm. You can't conceive of the infinite anger of God towards sinners. In fact, John 3.36, uh, those who believe in the Son have life, but those who do not have the Son, the wrath of God abides on them right now. How do you tell a sinner that God loves him? And especially, God loves you just the way you are. No, the way you are is the problem, yeah. not the solution. And tell a practicing homosexual God loves him just the way he is. Glad to hear it. I have no intention of changing. Well, no, you, you have to repent and give that up. Why? You told me God loves me just the way I am. What? You're stuck. That word wrath in John 3, 36 is the... Greek word orge, from which we get orgy, which is no boundaries, no limitations. If a person does not have Christ, and by the way, the Greeks had seven words for anger and wrath. That's the hottest. God's hottest wrath abides on a sinner right now. How can you tell him God loves him? When the Bible says exactly the opposite. The well, same thing with <clears throat> you can have Jesus as Savior now and make him Lord of your life later. <clears throat> you can't make him anything. God already made him Lord. You can't do that. 
And the Bible uses the phrase Savior and Lord. You want to guess how many times? None. Not once do those two words come where Savior is before Lord. Lord and Savior, 631 times. Gee, what a coincidence. (laughs) I used to have old football books before I had old religious books. And uh, the greatest blowout in college football history was in 1926, where Georgia Tech, big Georgia Tech, beat Little Cumberland College 222 to nothing. (laughs) It was 56 to nothing after one quarter. So I read into the history of this, and there were guys on the Kentucky football team who said, I'm not going up there to get slaughtered. And he stayed home, and a lot of the guys were just on the intramural team. We think that's a whitewash. How about 631 to nothing? Mm-hmm. And how can you say to somebody, you can accept Jesus as your personal Savior now and make him Lord of your life later, when the Bible never offers in that way? You have no right to offer Christ in a way the Bible never offers him. We have to be biblical on this stuff. You think they know enough about me now? Yeah, that's good. Um, you mentioned the Puritan first Puritan book you got was from the Master Seminary Library in there. It was from John Stone's. It was the first one I read. You read. It wasn't the first one I published. What was it? The first one you read. Jeremiah Burroughs on the Beatitudes. Now, I recently, and it was a lithograph of a 19th century edition. I asked John, what should I do? He said, anything on the Beatitudes or anything on suffering will sell. Or pick a name that they recognize. Well, Burroughs is known for the rare jewel of Christian contentment. Mm -hmm. So I picked him and the sermons on the Beatitudes. Well, this last year, I had a typist retype all 51 sermons, and I edited them into modern format. I don't think there are any here because it's a $50 book, and I can't sell it for 10 bucks like all the rest of them. But uh, that's the first book I published. And then the next one was a commentary on the book of Jude by William Jenkin. And then third one was The Almost Christian Discovered. And I found that... On the cover, which I just did on my little Macintosh computer at the time, on a program called PageMaker, The Almost Christian Discovered by Matthew Mead, down here in bold letters, bold letters forward by John MacArthur. And I found out people were buying it because they thought it was by John, because <laughs> <laughs> his name was in bigger print than Matthew Mead's. I don't care why they bought it, as long as they read it. What, was your, what is your favorite Puritan title? I think it's probably Grace by Christopher Love. He uh, graced the truth, growth, in different degrees. By the way, if we sell out of a book that you want, pay for it here and I'll ship it to you for free. You won't pay for any postage. Um, And he summarizes the book this way. Grace is the understanding that Christ is a better Savior than you are a sinner. Wow. Wow. What else do you need to know? Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, you could add up all the sins you've ever committed into the hundreds of thousands or even millions, and it would be a finite number. But Christ is an infinite Savior, and he has infinite mercy. And uh, that that was life-changing for me, so... That book is worth it just to come to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. And it's based on this thing I'm amazed at, Jim, is how well these Puritans knew the whole Bible. They weren't just New Covenant guys with the New Testament or the Pauline epistles. They'll preach a sermon out of Zephaniah 2.9. What? (laughs) Well, Christopher Love took this verse out of 1 Kings 14, I believe it is. And it talks about someone that says, The Lord found in him one good thing toward the Lord God of Israel. And love extrapolates from that, God will find the one thing you may have ever done right and categorize your life by that. We will look at the last thing you ever did wrong and say that's who you are. And God says, no, you couldn't do one right thing if your heart wasn't right before the Lord. And he goes through all these people in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. Harlots, liars, murderers, cowards. And he says, but God looks at our life as a whole, 
not as our latest failure. And that's how he could say that David, who committed murder and adultery, was a man after my own heart. In spite of the murder and adultery, not because of it. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that God, Jeremiah Burroughs, in one of his sermons on the Old Testament, <clears throat> um, was talking about uh, we need, under the new covenant, he says, God accepts the will for the deed. He says, under the old covenant, you had to perform everything perfectly yourself. No substitutes, no sureties. You either did it perfectly or damned forever. And you can make all the excuses you want and they won't do anything. But under the new covenant, God accepts the will for the deed. If you want to do good and you are kept from it for some reason, not other than just I'm not going to do it, God accepts it as a completed act. And under the new covenant, you don't need to make excuses for anything because if there's an excuse to be made, Christ will find it and will take it to God for you. Oh, 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 oh. Mm. That's why I did a conference on the Puritans in San Francisco one time. And a lady came up to me afterwards and said, why would you publish these hateful, bigoted, unloving people? And I said, which one of their books did you read that gave you that impression? Well, I've never read a single book of theirs. Gee, you know, in academic circles, we call that ignorance. (laughs) You're accusing them of this and you've never read a single word. She goes, well, everybody knows it. Well... I don't know it, so you can't say everybody. You can say everybody, but you knows it, but you can't say everybody knows it. But another lady came up afterwards and said, I came here ready to argue with you, but I can't argue with the thing you said because it was all so logical. She said, if you'd said simply, well, the Bible says, I I don't accept the Bible. But you didn't use the Bible. You just used logic to prove the Bible's points. I can't argue with anything. Thank you. I don't like debating women anyway. (laughs) They start crying and then the argument's over. What is the best-selling Puritan title that you published? I think it's Heaven Taken by Storm by (coughs) Thomas Watson. It's a pretty short book. I put it on the beginners. By the way, on our website, we have 10 three-packs. Basically, three books for the cost of one. There's a beginner's three-pack. If you've never read anything like this, here's three easy reads. And uh, none of those are here, but they're on the website, and, and you can do it that way. What are those three titles? That was my next question. What, well, it's where should uh, people begin? Heaven Taken by Storm, Grace by Christopher Love, and Saving Faith by, no, The Precious Things of God by John Angel James. And two of those books have forwards by MacArthur. John's a great lover of the Puritans. So, uh, the, the other book I would think is a bestseller is probably The Precious Things of God, where each chapter is something that God finds precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Yeah. Precious in the sight of the Lord. There are about 20, though. Very encouraging. Uh, what, how, how many books a year do you publish? Well, this last year we published five. Um, the Lord has brought along a very wealthy couple that says we want to see as many of these books in print as we can. So they have personally underwritten eight of the last 12. Wow. And that's the only way we can publish. Sales aren't that great. Um, and since the pandemic, it, they've just tanked. And I would think that people would be home reading books now. They're not. They're watching Netflix. Mm-hmm. They're going to the movies. They're, they're watching something on uh, Amazon Prime or something. So sales have been poor, and uh, but we did five books. We did the last three all at once because the cost of paper has gone way up. And because of the cost of fuel, the freight costs to get them to me have gone way up. The last book we did, they charged me $978 freight to put them on a truck, on a pallet, and send them to Orlando. What am I going to do? That's what they cost. Um, 
Anything else? Don't ask me what my favorite book is. That's like asking you which one of your kids do you like the most. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> Whichever one's standing right in front of me at the moment. A <laughs> um, couple of personal questions, more lighthearted a little bit before we finish up. What do you do to relax? What is your downtime? Uh, I go to the movies. I like a good story. I go to the movies more for the popcorn than anything else. That's what I ask for for my birthday, Father's Day, and Christmas every year is gift cards to the movies. So I haven't paid for a movie in 15 years. <laughs> uh, and I order a large butter with a little popcorn on it. And, uh, and then I get a drink and I say, I want more drink than ice. Oh. Yeah, last time you gave me a large ice with two sips of drink in it. I, I want a large drink with a little ice. And uh, I've walked out of more movies recently than I've vi- finished. Without telling me what movies you enjoy, what genre do you enjoy? Um, where I like the character. If I'm pulling for the character, if it's just a story, if there's no good guys, I won't stay. If everybody's varying degrees of bad, and he's only good because he's less bad than that guy, I won't want. Rocky, one of my favorites. Mary Poppins. Uh, that was 1963. It's still one of. There's a couple faith based movies I would highly recommend. One is called Greater. Mm. And it's a true story yeah. about a guy who was a walk on at Arkansas in football. <clears throat> they said, You'll never play here. You can come on and be a tackling dummy. But... And the kid was a committed Christian. <clears throat> He studied hard. He lost 80 pounds of fat and put on 40 pounds of muscle. His senior year, he was a first-team All-American guard. Signed, was drafted in the first round by the Indianapolis Colts and uh, went to training camp. And they said, well, we're having a party tonight after practices. Now I promised my mom I'd take her to church tomorrow. Well, I'm about to give away the ending. That's okay. He was killed on the way home. And... Uh, At his funeral, all of his players, colleagues, coaches came. And the whole movie is, God is greater than that. They now named the trophy they give every year to the top walk-on in Division I football, the Brian Bosworth Trophy. And then there's a movie called Risen, which is... The story is, here's a Roman centurion who witnesses the crucifixion. And he sees them take the body, limp body down, cart it off to put in a tomb. Well, that's not, a couple of days later, the story's gone around, he's not there anymore. So his boss, the Roman pontiff at the time, or Pontius at the time, says, you need to debunk this theory. It's getting around all over the place. And he said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to prove that the disciples stole the body and that he's really dead. So he sets about to do that. But he's as an unbeliever as there can be. And he finds where the disciples are meeting and he walks in unannounced and there's Jesus having dinner with the disciples. And his jaw drops. And Jesus says, come on in, friend. Everybody's welcome. And he can't talk I watched you die. And Jesus says this, what can I tell you? (laughs) So he starts following them around. And uh, again, his whole job is to debunk this. And he says, well, first of all, no group of disciples could have moved that stone. That's too heavy a stone. And it was sealed. These are fishermen and tax collectors. They, They couldn't have done that. Well, he follows Jesus around And he's starting to get interested. Well, they're in this one city where they're sitting around eating fish and bread. And I don't know if it's leftovers from the 5,000 or not, but all of a sudden there's some clamor and the townspeople are driving a leper out of the city, yelling, unclean, unclean, get out, get out. And you see the guy's got boils all over his face and bumps on his hands and arms and And the Roman guy says to uh, Matthew, 
Why do you follow him? And Matthew says, well, some of us have doubted. And he says, then why do you stay with him? All of a sudden, Jesus gets up from the fire, grabs a fish and a piece of bread, takes it out to the man who's been run out of town, hands it to him. The man looks at him in disbelief. Jesus says, stand up. He embraces him. He touches him like this and walks away. Everything's gone. He's been healed completely. And Matthew says to the Roman, that's why. I love that. Mm. But there's some funny stuff in there. Jesus is walking. The disciples have been out fishing all night. They haven't caught a thing. Jesus shows up on the shore and he yells out, any luck? (laughs) (laughs) And they said, no, we've been fishing all night. And he goes, try the other side of the boat. Well, of course, they're about as ticked off as can be that he would say, like, we're fishermen and you don't think we've done that? He says, throw your nuts on the other side of the boat. They do, and they almost capsize the boat. The fish are jumping into the net. He says, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some humor in there. Uh, and the one, the other one is uh, called Paul, Apostle of Christ. I love the ending. At the ending, Paul is beheaded, and the guy who does the beheading apologizes for what he has to do. And Paul says, do your job well. And uh, when Christopher Love was beheaded, he handed the guy doing it a coin and said, get it right the first time, will you? Because <laughs> after they'd cut a couple guys' heads off, the blade was dull. And he said, get it right the first time. And uh, so in the Paul Apostle of Christ, he's beheaded. And in the next scene, you see him and you assume it's heaven. And here come scores of people whose conversion they owed to Paul, coming to hug him and embrace him. And then over the hill, here comes Jesus. Just think, well done, thou good and faithful Mm -hmm. servant. What church do you attend? The St. John's Presbyterian Church. It's a Presbyterian church in America. We're the conservative Presbyterian. It's a traditional worship service. We sing uh, psalms and hymns. And uh, 40 40 to 45 minutes for the sermon, which would be a short one for you. (laughs) And uh, we have a very respectful liturgy, which I appreciate. Well, sometimes I tell them it's like a high school pep rally. Lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. (laughs) (laughs) What is your area of service to the body there? What do you do? Uh, they've asked me to teach Sunday school from time to time. I preach when the pastor's sick. Uh, he's got Crohn's disease. And he can't always muster up the energy to get up there and do it. And he'll, He's called me at 7.30 in the morning. It's, I can't go. Can you fill in? Yeah, thanks. It's a little hard that the only time people call is if something goes wrong. Yeah. How big of a church is it? Uh, we have about 180 it's a church, it's no longer a church plant. We only started 13 months ago. And uh, it became a particular church after one year. And they've got enough money where they're looking to buy a building now. Uh, they're doing very well. Uh, this pastor is the best combination of pastor teacher I've ever had. Obviously, I've had better preachers, I've had better pastors. But he's the best combination of the two. Mm. And I I just love the guy to death. How old is he? I think he's uh, 47, 50. I talked to him last week and he said, I'm getting infusions. I said, for what? Iron? He says, I'm very anemic. I said, I thought you were Italian. (laughs) (laughs) Great guy. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.